Welcome to year four of the Parsha podcast. It's an absolute joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to study the Parsha with you once again for this fourth year of the Parsha podcast. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, based out of Houston, Texas. I work for a wonderful organization called Torch. I'm actually right now recording from the studios at the Torch Center. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I am looking forward to another wonderful year of studying the Parsha with y'all together. And the plan for this year is that on the beginning of the week, we're going to re-upload, rebroadcast the Parsha podcast from last year, the one that covered the entire Parsha. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, there is a large segment of the Parsha podcast audience that didn't listen that or that joined in middle of the year. So they didn't listen to many of the episodes of the beginning of Genesis and Exodus, etc., and therefore want to give those people an opportunity to be able to enjoy the Parsha podcast for this year and to catch up and to finish it, finish the whole Torah, hopefully, uh, this year. In addition, I found when I was editing Parsha Spiracious, even though I edited it last year, I decided to re-listen to it and re-edit it, I found that there were so many little tidbits and little ideas that I had forgotten over the course of the year. So even someone like me, who actually, not only did I listen to the podcast last year, I actually produced it. I found so much value in once again going through it again. So uh, that is maybe words of encouragement if someone really wants to once again for a second consecutive year delve deeply into the Parsha, it might be uh, a good idea to be able to listen to the Parsha podcast from last year once again. So that's going to be the beginning of the week. Please, God, we're going to re-upload the podcast from last year. But in addition, my plan is that towards the end of the week, each week we're going to offer a shorter podcast in the Parsha, not one that's going to cover the entire Parsha, but instead to zone in, to focus in on one idea, be it a theme that appears in the parsha, or an idea that appears in the parsha, or one of the interesting comments that elaborates on a, on a general principle of Torah or of Jewish faith from the parsha, and to be able to develop and go deeper on one idea uh, each week. And because this week is the first week of the Torah, first parsha, parsha is voracious, I thought it was appropriate to examine a very fundamental introduction to the Torah that is offered by the Ramban. Of course, the Ramban, we've mentioned his name numerous times, and please God will mention it throughout the whole year. He is one of the fundamental commentaries of the Torah. He lived in the 13th century. He lived in Spain, and subsequently he actually moved to Israel. He passed away in Israel, I believe, the years 1269. And He has one of the most diverse commentaries in the Torah. It, of course, deals with the basic understanding of the text. Uh, Almost every comment begins with citing Rashi or citing the Ibn Ezra, some of the other great commentators in the Torah, and then he asks questions and elaborates on it, offers novel interpretations, and really, it's one of the great commentaries on the Torah. And at the very beginning of the book of Genesis... He provides a, an introduction to the Torah. Every year I, I reread it. It's so enlightening and so valuable. I thought it would be a very appropriate thing to share on the maiden episode of year four of the Parsha podcast. And it covers a lot of central concepts about the Torah. So, for example, it starts off with the question of who's the author of the Torah. Of course, if we're approaching the Torah with knowing nothing, it's a very valuable, important question to try to delve into what is the authorship, who wrote the Torah, and who is the author of the Torah. And then he goes on to dis- to discussing what is the content of the Torah, what's included in the Torah, and finally ends off with a very interesting discussion about the various dimensions of the Torah and the various other existences or layers that are inherent with the- within the Torah. So I want to go through this comment. Let's begin. He begins... The very first sentence of his comment is Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, Moses, our master, he wrote this book, which is the book of Genesis, together with the whole Torah 
from the mouth of God. So it's interesting that the question of authorship and the question of writership or who wrote the Torah versus who authored the Torah, says the Ramban, we have different answers to those questions. We say that Moshe wrote the Torah, but he wasn't the author of the Torah. It was God who authored the Torah, and he told to Moses what to write, and Moses started writing. So Moses, the first word of the Torah is Bereshis, and God says to Moshe, okay, write Bereshis, and Moshe writes Bereshis. So Moshe is the writer, but God is the author. And then he deals with the question, okay, so when was this written? So he cites a dispute in the Talmud. The Talmud book of Gittin, page 60, tells us that there's two opinions to when, as to when Moses wrote the written Torah. According to one, he wrote it in pieces, meaning that at Sinai, Moses began writing the Torah. Sinai, the Sinai experience is told many times throughout the Torah, but the first time it's told over is in the book of Exodus in chapter 1920. And then, of course, the Jewish people remain at Sinai for for many uh, months and many parshas. But at Sinai, Moshe begins writing the Torah. And then when he gets down from Sinai, and then the Torah pivots talking about the tabernacle, well, then he writes that portion. And then he writes the later portions subsequently. And finally, at the end of 40 years, at the end of Moshe's lifetime, the verse tells us in in Deuteronomy chapter 31 that Moshe delivers a finalized version, a written copy of the Torah scroll from beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. He delivers that initially to the tribe of, of Levi and finally to the rest of the tribes. That's one opinion, is that the Torah is written or that the process of the Torah was done was done piecemeal. It was bunches. Moshe wrote this section and that, and then subsequently finished it later on. There is a second opinion that says that Moshe wrote all the Torah all at once at the very end of the forty years when he's about to pass away. God says, "Okay, now it's time to write it all down. To write the written version of the Torah down. To write the Torah scroll down." And Moshe writes it again from the Word of God. But regardless of which opinion we are following, says the Ramban, it's important to stress that Moshe wrote the entire Torah from beginning to end from the word of God. Now, he points out something very interesting. If Moshe is the writer, well, how come he writes about himself in third person? The prophet Ezekiel, for example, he begins the book of Ezekiel that the word of God was to me. He's the author of the book. He's the writer of the book. And he is writing about himself in first person. Book of Jeremiah, same thing. The word of God was to me. Whereas in the Torah, even though Moshe is the writer, it does not attribute him as speaking in first person. And it talks about things that happened before Moses was born. And even once it mentions Moses, it doesn't use his name. And... The reason why, again, says says the Rabban, it because because there's a separation between the writer and the author. The author is God, and Moses is the is the scribe, is the he, he's the one who's doing the transcription, and therefore he is writing about himself in third person. And he points out interesting question that people have raised. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, there's many times that Moshe does speak about himself in first person. And I prayed to God, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23. Why is that book different? So this is an important point to mention. A lot of people make the mistaken assumption that the book of Deuteronomy is somehow different than the rest of the books because the tone and the kind of language that's used and even the 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 the, the nature of, so to speak, the narrative is very different than the rest of the Torah. And the answer, says the Ramban, is you have to go to the very first verse in the book of Deuteronomy. And the verse begins, these are the words that Moses spoke to the whole people, saying, meaning that the narrator, so to speak, of the Torah is telling us that this is a citation, this is a quote from Moses. And thus, of course, when Moses actually spoke to the Jewish people, he used first person and therefore it at the beginning tells us these are the words of Moses and then it, it actually quotes the words of Moses as he said them. And thus, the Ramban answers the question, very interesting question, why does the Torah not begin 
And God spoke to Moses all these words saying, that should be the very first verse of the Torah. The very first verse. Before it says the word voracious. The very first verse of Genesis. And these are the words that God spoke to Moses saying. Why does it not have that verse? Because no, Moshe is, he is the one who is writing over the Torah in third, in third person. And therefore he's writing down what God says to him. And therefore, even when he talks about himself, he talks about himself in third person. And the question is why? So that's the next question that the Ramban deals with. Why is the Torah written in this fashion? And he gives us a very puzzling, at least initially, but a very powerful answer. He says, because the Torah, and not just the concepts of the Torah, the actual words of the Torah from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, that actually preceded the birth of of Moses. Not only did it precede the birth of Moses, it preceded the creation of the world. And he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that even before the world was created, the Torah was extant, the Torah existed in the form of black fire on top of white fire. Now, I want to give a quick disclaimer. This is a citation from our sages but one that's clearly not easily understood. What does it mean that the Torah existed before the world was created? And what does it mean that it existed in this fashion, that it was black fire on top of white fire? It's something that's very Kabbalistic. It's very much beyond the scope of, of what we're understanding. Even the Rabban acknowledges that. But there is an idea, and it's, it's cited actually throughout Talmud. For example, uh, we mentioned this in the past. When Moses goes up to heaven to get the Torah... The Talmud in the book of, of Shabbos tells us that the angels were very puzzled at the appearance of an earthling in heaven, and they asked God, well, why is Moses here? Why is this individual here? To get the Torah, God responded. The Torah? You're going to give it the Torah that preceded the world by 974 generations? You're going to give it to lowly earthlings? So again, we have this citation of the Talmud in, in the book of Shabbos, page 88b, that tells us that the Torah preceded the world by 974 generations. In addition, there's a very famous citation from the Zohar that the Almighty used the Torah as a blueprint for the world. He looked through the Torah, he examined the Torah, and that was the blueprint that he followed to create the world. So again, there are plenty of sources to this fact that the Torah actually preceded the world. And therefore, when Moses is writing it down, Moses takes out the scroll and starts writing from the word Beratius, it's almost as if, says the Ramban, he's not writing anything new. He is just copying from an an existing book that had those same words already, and therefore he is not writing something that's, 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 that's novel necessarily, because those words existed prior, and therefore he doesn't attribute himself. He doesn't write with with respect to himself in first person. It's not a new book. It's a book that's been around before the world was even created. Now, obviously, that's a very puzzling idea because you look at the Torah and it talks about individuals and challenges and stories and episodes, and we believe in, of course, the idea of free will. Abraham could have not offered a son as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. He could not, he could have chosen to not engage in the story of the binding of Isaac. Yet, according to this, at least initially, the Ramban is going to talk about this a little bit further. At least initially in this Ramban, it says that actually the Torah scroll with every letter was actually preceding the world. And thus that would raise the question of how the Torah could have been fashioned before the world, before the events described in the Torah actually occurred. But that's, again, the general introduction, and he'll get to this, to the answer to those questions in a little bit. But the very first point that he tackles is the question of writing in the Torah and authorship of the Torah, and he gives us the answer. God tells Moses to write it, but it, it really existed prior in some other fashion, as we shall see, God's the author and Moses is the writer. And then he pivots to talking about what, well, what's included in the Torah. Of course, we mentioned this in the past, there's different layers of, of understanding of the Torah. There is the simple reading of the, of the text 
And then there are deeper and deeper and deeper and infinitely deeper layers of understanding. And the Rabban tells us, and he goes through this in, in very, in great length, that every form of wisdom, every bit of insight, every bit of knowledge, and by the way, later commentaries would add, every bit of history is actually included in the Torah. And he tells us that the laws of nature, the laws of physics, the wisdom of all things is actually in the Torah, either explicitly or in some sort of hint. He quotes the Talmud. The Talmud tells us in the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 21b, that there are 50 gates of understanding that were created in the world, and all of them were given to Moses, son one. With the exception of one, there was one gate of wisdom, of, of insight, of understanding that Moses was not privy to. What does this mean? What are these 50 gates of wisdom? So the Rabban tells us that these 50 gates of wisdom are everything or every general idea or general concept in the world has parameters of understanding to it, which is considered its own gate. So for example, the creation of the trees. There's a gate of wisdom of understanding of the creation of the trees. The creation of the wild animals is a separate one. The birds is a separate one. The creeping crawlers, the fish is a separate one. What about people? More sophisticated, more complicated. That too has its gate of understanding. And the Ramadan tells us that if you truly understood this gate of wisdom, this gate of understanding, you would be able to really understand a person on a very fundamental level. And he quotes our sages that tells us that someone who truly understands human nature to this very fundamental way, if they see a person, they will be able to tell just by looking at them what their recent actions were. So for example, if they were a thief or if they were an adulterer or if they were someone who behaved in in some sort of improper fashion, it would be evident to someone who understands that gate of wisdom, it would be ev- evident to them right away, by just by looking at them. In addition, he talks about the galaxies and the heavens and the stars and the constellations. Each one of these things has for it its own gate of wisdom that is different than the other gates of wisdom. And the total count of all that is 50. And with the exception of one of them, Moses knew it all. What is that one gate of wisdom of understanding that Moses did not know, that was not given to any creation, only the creator knows it? That is the complete knowledge of the creator, the complete understanding of God himself. That was not given to anyone and not to Moses. And then the Ramban adds, all this wisdom, all this knowledge that covers everything, the entire spectrum of existence, all that knowledge, again, with the exception of that one gate of wisdom, all that was given to Moses, and all that was written in the Torah in some fashion. Of course, some of it is explicit, but some of it is hinted in all kinds of different ways. There's all these other ways that the Torah is conveying wisdom that are completely subterranean, completely hidden, completely embedded in the fabric of Torah. So it's not in the words, but it's in the letters. It's not in the letters, it's in the gematrias. It's not in the gematrias, it's in the shapes of the letters. Some letters are shaped differently, and all that contains within it all this wisdom. It's in the serifs, the little jots and tittles of the letters. It's in the crowns Above the letters, we know there's certain letters in the Torah, you look at the Torah scroll, that have these little crowns on top of the letters. Says the Ramban, quoted from the Talmud, within those crowns, there's all kinds of knowledge that's totally beyond us, but that's all included in what Moshe was conveyed by God and how he wrote it in this Torah. And the Torah scroll that we have, of course, there's the simple level that we try to read it at. But he's revealing to us that there's all kinds of other levels that are accessible maybe with, you know, to great scholars and to people who have a tradition. So he quotes the story that 
when Moses ascended to heaven, he saw God making little crownlets above the letters. Why are you making the crowns above the letters? Well, there's going to be someone in many years who is going to deduce piles and piles of laws out of each crownlet above the letter. And that too, God reveals to Moses, is an extension or, or, or a part, a component of the Torah that I'm going to be conveying to you. And again, the Ramban elaborates on this point by talking about all the wisdom that Ezekiel had and how he understood the the nature of of uh, what's called the Maise Merkava, which is the chariot of God, a very Kabbalistic and uh, obviously completely beyond us, our understanding, but a description of God's chariot, so to speak, that's found in chapter one of the book of Ezekiel. He talks about the wisdom that King Solomon had, that he was able to, you know, write books of of pharmacology based upon his understanding of various herbs and roots. Where did he, where did he get all that from? All that was derived from the Torah. He talks about King Solomon. Talmud tells us even that King Solomon, when he heard birds chirping, he was able to understand what they were communicating to each other. He was able to understand really everything, all the wisdom, not quite on the level of Moses, but all the wisdom, the wisest man that's ever lived, with the exception of Moses, that is all rooted in the Torah. And he gives a whole list of all these, uh, of all these domains, of all these disciplines that we know nothing of. All of that King Solomon deduced and derived from the Torah, either with its simple reading or with its uh, the the commentary or the, the explanation of it or the various letters or serifs or things like that. Okay, so he he really elaborates on that point. But I want to, I want to conclude his his description uh, or his introduction to the Torah by reading the last the last little bit. Uh, one of the last paragraphs here. He says, we also have a tradition of truth that the entire Torah is all names of the Almighty of the Holy One, blessed is He. And this is an idea that we find in many places in Jewish literature, that the reading of the Torah could be read in two ways. That we could read it in the way we typically read it. Bereish is bar Elohim. In the beginning God, of of God's creation, God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, it's the first verse of the Torah. But actually, the same letters can be reshuffled. You can make the breaks between the letters differently. And you could read, for example, instead of Bereshis, Bara Elohim, you could read Berosh Yisbara El Hayam. That's what the Ramban tells us. That's the same three words that begin the Torah but you're actually making the breaks between the two words, between one word and the word that follows it. You're making the break diff- in different places, and that spells out an entire different, entirely different narrative. Says the Rabban, that is all names of God. So this is again another dimension of Torah beyond what we already talked about. This idea that the entire Torah exists in this other way, in this other dimension as entirely names of God. I want to point out that the Kabbalists tell us this same idea in a different way. We know, of course, that there's names of God, various names that are used in the Torah, but even that, there are what's called kinuyim, or nicknames of the name of God. Some of them are the names that can never be erased. Some of them are names of God, like Gadol, Nora, names like that, which means great or awesome. These are also names of God, but not names that have that same sanctity. Of course, not names like the, the most, the holiest name, the ineffable forename of God, the tetragram as it's called. That's the holiest name, but there's other names as well. And, and every name has nicknames and every nickname has nicknames. And thus all the words of the Torah really are all nicknames of nicknames of nicknames of the name and the, the names of God that we have. So that's another idea uh, that the Ramban again hints at. And consequently tells us the Ramban, what happens if you have a Torah scroll that's missing one letter? It's missing a letter. But that letter is not so significant because it doesn't change the meaning of, of the words or of the sentence. What is the status of that Torah scroll? Says the Ramban, again, that this is the Jewish law. The law is that if you have a Torah scroll that's lacking one letter, 
even if it's a letter that does not change the meaning of the word. Why? Because in Hebrew, or certainly in, in biblical Hebrew, there are sometimes there are no vowels, and the vowels are in the form of nikudot, or, or these, these these dashes and dots that go above and, and below the letters that tell us how to pronounce that word. So you'll have just consonants, and the vowels are hidden. And in, in other cases, you'll have the vowels show up in the form of letters. So if you, let's say, have a word that has a letter that doesn't really serve as a consonant but instead as a vowel, and there are other instances in the Torah where that very same word appears but it's spelled differently, and you decide to take out that vowel or maybe you make a mistake and you forgot to write in that vowel as a letter. So you may say quite justifiably, look, I didn't misspell the word. There's many other places in the Torah that the word spelled that same way. Maybe the Torah scroll should be kosher. And the law is that the entire Torah scroll is invalidated. And this doesn't make any sense to us. Why? The, the word is spelled correctly as evidenced by the fact that elsewhere in the Torah, that, that's the way that word is spelled. And the answer, says the Ramban, is because, yes, on the simple reading level, on, the, on that layer, that dimension of the Torah, there's nothing wrong with how that word is spelled. But on the other way, on the way of reading of the Torah, that it's names of God, well, then you're actually deducting or you're adding a letter to the name of God. And therefore, that, of course, is sacrilegious. And therefore, the Torah scroll is more than just a simple level of, of reading of understanding. It's also this very advanced level. And if you corrupt that level, the Torah itself is invalidated. And he suggests or he speculates that when the Torah was written with black fire on top of white fire, when it was written in that fashion, it was written without any breaks in the words and it was possible for it to be read either in the fashion like we read today, i.e. make the breaks between the letters spelling out the words that are spelled in our Torah or you could have made the breaks in different locations and you could have spelled out the entire different narrative which would only be names of God. So that's what he ends and he ends off with – he ends off his introduction, the Ramban does, with a warning that we shouldn't get too deeply into the matters of Kabbalah unless you have a tradition, unless you have a teacher that's able to teach you. You're not going to understand it. Uh, he's going to, obviously, throughout the throughout his commentary, he's going to invoke many of the deep ideas of the Kabbalah, but he's warning us at the very beginning that we shouldn't really deal with it. It's beyond us. Don't ask too many questions. That that is greater than you, don't don't derive, that is stronger than you, don't ponder, something was beyond you, don't try to understand, something that's covered from you, don't don't ask about. Only what you're able to understand, only that way, you don't bite off more than you can chew. We have no ASEC, we have no business dealing with the hidden aspects of the Torah. So despite the fact that he gives us some of these secrets of the Torah, he advises us to not dwell on it uh, too much. But I think this is a very, this is a very valuable uh, introduction to Torah. Of course, we're not going to practically really dwell in that realm and that domain of the, of the, of the letters, of the gematrias, of the, uh, of the shapes of the letters. Of course, those things are beyond us. But I think it's important as, as we're, we're approaching the Torah, we're, we're, we're starting it again. It's, it's, important, it's important to have this knowledge that the Torah is not just another book. It precedes the world. It has all kinds, all manners of of, of layers and layers upon layers and tapestries upon tapestries of understanding. And, of course, it's important for us to keep in mind everything's in the Torah. All the wisdom that's possibly conceivable is found in the Torah. Uh, maybe there's the, you know, the, uh, the, the last of the 50 gates of, of wisdom. Maybe that's beyond us. But Mo- Moshe was a human like us and, and he was able to understand 49 out of the 50 gates of wisdom. So again, even though these things are not as very practical for us, I think it's, it is, it does serve as a valuable introduction. Of course, how the Ramban begins that Moshe wrote it, but don't make the mistake to misattribute Moshe as the author. He's not the author. In fact, there is no word that Moshe wrote himself. The Talmud tells us the book of Sanhedrin, page 99, that if you say that Moshe wrote based upon his own decision, one word of the Torah, you're actually rejecting a fundamental principle of the Torah. The principle is God is the author and this is the book that he delivered to us. And this is just an amazing thing that we have the opportunity 
to be delivered, to be able to study the Torah, to study the book written by God, authored by God, and he gave it to us to be able to enhance our lives and to maximize the pleasure that we could have in this world. This is the guidebook. This is the blueprint. This is the way. This is the instructions. This is the manual to maximize life. It's an absolute joy to begin the fourth year of the Parsha Podcast together. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you, and I look forward to studying the Parsha with you each and every week.